make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> Going to be a line between unofficial and official, and that's the contentious line that that's exactly where we are, and that's the danger of it. I think Sotomayor mentioned. Um, that there's this potential for abuse now when the president is not going to be held accountable for questionable conduct because it's going to be considered within um, their official acts. And so what I think might happen uh, moving forward or what could potentially happen, uh, our future, to, to Karina's point, future presidents could push the boundaries, just as you're in your hypo, of their official duties. They can they can make things within, you know, these uh, questionable acts within their official duties, knowing that they would likely be shielded from criminal prosecution for this broad range of actions. Right. So it could the, this ruling could encourage presidents to take controversial, risky, you know, uh, actions because they'll have less fear of legal consequences. And that's the danger of it. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, we're happy to have you. Don't forget to like and subscribe because we always forget to say that. I'm smash your, that like button. Yeah, smash it. Just crush it. Um, I'm your political host, Will Wright, joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing well. Thanks, Will. And we are so delighted to have two extremely intelligent um, women on the show to talk to us about all things Constitution and Supreme Court. Uh, one of them, our longtime listeners will be familiar with, is Karina Lane. And um, a new person to the show, Daniel Wingfield, um, is here to join us as well. Um, but I am not going to try to articulate their long um, curricula vitae. Um, I'm going to let them do it themselves. So, Karina, tell our audience who you are, what it is you do, and um, how awesome we are. They're so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm Karina Lane. Uh, I'm a professor uh, here at University of Richmond School of Law. I think I'm in my 23rd year, so I have been around for a minute. Um, I'm a constitutional historian. I um, am a former prosecutor. I teach criminal procedure and evidence and uh, have uh, my, my specialty is the death penalty. So I teach a course on that. And while I'm here introducing myself, I do have a book coming out Easter 2025 yes. called Secrets of the Killing State, the untold story of lethal injection. Ooh. So sorry, I had to plug that. And that's all I've got. Well, you're going to be back on to talk about that. I that's amazing. So. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Danielle. Who are you? Thank you, Will. Thank you, Josh, for having me. I am yes. a colleague of the wonderful Karina Lane over here at Richmond Law, and I teach constitutional law. Um, so that's why you have me here today. Uh, my expertise is as a legal historian of civil rights. So I teach a civil rights seminar here, uh, just a perfect place in Virginia, in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for for being here. We we really enjoy um, being able to talk to smart people to kind of help educate us about you know what's happening in our country, our world, um, and one one of the things I know I specifically wanted to have both of you on here to talk about is something that's kind of been out of the news cycle uh, for a little bit, but I think still has plenty of implications, kind of um, more broadly for the country. And, and I haven't really heard very many um, good interpretations or good discussions about it. So I'm hoping that that you all can shed light on the immunity case that seemingly gave the next president or the current president, I guess, um, unlimited power. Uh, so so can you tell us just a little bit about the case that, um, you know, gave us this immunity ruling um, and. You know, what are what are what were some of the core legal principles that that might have underpinned um, the the SCOTUS ruling? Yeah, I can kick us off with a little framing. Um, so the recent the 2024 SCOTUS term, we uh, got Trump versus United States. And that case is addressing the scope of 
as you just mentioned, presidential immunity. But what it's doing is building on two previous earlier decisions that is worth knowing. So um, we have Nixon versus Fitzgerald in 1982. And then 15 years later, the court ruled in Clinton versus Jones in 1997. Now, in Nixon, the court ruled that both sitting and former presidents enjoy absolute immunity, but it's from civil lawsuits and it's for actions taken in their official capacity. And then fast forward to Clinton, the court clarifies a bit more and held that this immunity does not extend to unofficial acts, um, nor does it protect a sitting president from civil actions related to acts before office. So when we arrive to 2024 with Trump versus United States, the court extends this concept of immunity, and now it's covering criminal prosecution for actions taken, and the court is calling it as an exercise of core constitutional powers while in office, right? So for actions that are within, then they create this outer perimeter. So they said, and if it's in this outer perimeter of a president's responsibilities, then there's only a presumptive immunity that would apply. So in effect, what's happening is that there's this new standard that's introducing a little bit of uncertainty (laughs) because now we have to, uh, the lower courts are going to have to define or distinguish between official and unofficial acts. Uh, So what we see is the court's opinion leaving unresolved whether certain conduct by former President Trump like, i.e., his communications with state officials about election fraud, for example, falls within his official capacity. Um, and then so it was remanded uh, so that the lower court could make these fact specific determinations. That's the skinny. That's like the, the short. Part. I, I, I have to ask to, you know, to you two college professors that have to teach this stuff, like, is it frustrating or exciting when <laughs> SCOTUS makes like these rulings that seem to kind of upend what most average Americans probably thought was like settled law. What, 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 what's your experience, Karina? Well, I'm not teaching a core constitutional law. I teach constitutional law in the criminal procedure realm. And um, they're making decisions all the time. Um, I just taught one this week, Torres, and I was like, well, you know, courts don't, they did something totally new and courts don't really know what to do with it. So we're, we're experiencing this in real time, but, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to pass the bug back over to, um, uh, Danielle, but I need you to know, like, we're so lucky. I'm going to listen mostly and learn a lot about this immunity. I know a little bit, but like, you're talking to the expert on, you know, all things constitutional law. Um, but I, I just want to say I'm I'm just so proud of Danielle Wingfield being here. And I'm just so proud to be her colleague. She is amazing. And so I'm just, you know, mostly I'm just on this part. I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. I don't know a lot of sense. Just, because it's, because possible, it's a, it's a cultural element, though, you know. Yeah, but you just like broke it down in a second and made it you like flattened it out awesome. in a way that I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, that's it's a great big case. And I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, that is exactly what it says. But I couldn't have done what you just did. So anyway, kudos to you. Yeah, no, there's I think students are. Thank you, Karina. I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you and especially you. Um their students' frustration mostly is what I have to manage, right? Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't mind. I'm here to like learn it all and teach it all. And I mean, f- for the average citizen, it is. I imagine that's frustrating. And certainly for students, it's frustrating because they just want to know what the law is so that they can pass my test and go and be lawyers. And <laughs> um, and so they come in thinking they know and they kind of got it settled in their brains. And then I have to say, it's really, you know, we can, they the court can do what it wants to do. Um, and so I have to explain how that, that function is. Um, and that certainly leads to some frustration for sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, I, I think about this case and, I'm like, I didn't realize about the Nixon um, v. Gerald or Fitzgerald rather and Clinton v. Jones. Um, And I'm just imagining, I'm like, okay, you know, I go about my life and I think I can't do certain things because I will get arrested. 
and then I will get charged. I mean, not that I'm thinking about doing a lot of illegal things, but I'm just saying in general, I I, I kind of have this sense like I can't just do whatever. I don't have immunity uh, from all these things. Like, would I like to have immunity? Sure. I guess I'd love to have immunity and, and not have to worry ever about, you know, are my actions going to have consequences legally for me? So why is it that I can kind of walk around and have to be under this sense of law and the president of the United States does it. Now, I mean, I understand that, and and maybe I'm getting that completely wrong. So that's kind of why I'm bringing the question out there because it's really about what is kind of the balance here? Like how much immunity does a president really need in order to perform their duties does the question make sense? I mean, it, it seems like they should have some way. They should be able to do things I can't, for sure, because they're they're running the most powerful country in the world, right? And and they have to make decisions I can't, I don't ever have to think about. And yet at the same time, it seems like that even should create more accountab- accountability because of how their decisions affect a huge amount of people. Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on that. I'll jump in first and then Karina, you jump right on in there. I think you hit the nail on the head, Josh, right? Like there is certainly a balancing test that's happening here. And what the court is having to do is balance the need for a president to be able to perform their official duties without distraction of constant legal threats. Um, And that's, you know, they're balancing that against exactly what you just mentioned, the necessity of holding presidents accountable for misconduct. Right. And so um, the ruling in the Trump versus United States case, I read it as tipping the balance toward protecting the president's ability to perform official acts um, and therefore offering more protection, immunity for um, these official actions um, and setting the bar pretty high for being able to prosecute um, these actions criminally. Um, And and what we're seeing is an echo of concerns that were previously raised in Nixon about the unique position of the presidency. Uh, But it also intensifies this tension that you're pulling out between immunity and accountability. And that was highlighted later in Clinton versus Jones. And so what what was interesting to me is in uh, Justice Sotomayor's dissent, she pulls out, you know, even more concern about the president being above the law. And as citizens, I think you're right. We don't like the feeling that the president gets to be above the law while we can't be above the law. So, um, no, that, yeah, that question makes a lot of sense. And that's exactly, I think, what the court is grappling with here. I don't know. What do you think, Karina? Well, I agree with everything you said, of course. But um, I'll bring in the like as a former prosecutor, you know, as your former prosecutor, I will tell you, you know, there is a difference between the civil law and the criminal law. And, you know, you can think of it like this. I always think of it like this. You know, we have these bounds that we've all agreed we're going to live by. Beyond those bounds is civil liability, tort law, right? You punch somebody, you run into their car, you exceeded the bounds of the rules that we all decided to live by, you can get sued. When you go beyond the tort, beyond the civil liability, Now it's like you're so far out of the bounds that we have criminalized you. We have criminalized your conduct. We've said, oh, that's way beyond civil liability. And so, you know, when I look at that from my perspective, I say, look, it's one thing to say, you know, as Danielle did here, to say, well, you know, we don't really want them thinking about, you know, I could get sued over this or that. You know, we want them focused on what they have to do. It's an entirely different ball of wax to say you can go so far beyond that you are actually violating the criminal law. We would put ordinary citizens in jail, in prison, And in fact, you know, some of these fake electors, they're being prosecuted for what they're for what they're doing or what they've done. So, you know, there's this basic equity fairness principle that is just like, you know, when you think about what the criminal law is, 
I don't see any, uh, uh, personally, if I was uh, on the court, I'd be right next to Sotomayor for sure. Um, of course, I agree with her on most things. But, you know, I'd be saying, no, 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 criminal liability. I, I actually do want you thinking about that. Because if you've gone so far beyond that you think you might be in the sphere of criminal liability, um, you can think about that all day long because you should be subject to that. Because everyone else is subject to that. And Joss, as, as you mentioned, you know, the president is the, I, I actually think the president of the United States it is certainly the most powerful person in the United States, single individual person. But I think there's an argument that the president of the United States is the most powerful person in the world. And for that person to be beyond uh, the scope of criminal liability, I don't care if it's your official acts. If you are using your official, if you, you know, if you're in the official acts, we should care more. We should be watching more closely. Not less. Not like, oh, as long as you're using your power as the president, you can also break the law. No, no, that's the last thing we want you doing. So anyway, again, just your former prosecutor chiming in there. I, I think it's, I agree. Yeah, I think it's a real, real problem. And I think it's a massive extension of what the court had done in previous immunity rulings. And and now we're left with this situation of, yeah, but no president would would break the criminal law. We have really? relied on norms to our detriment in a certain administration not so long ago where we saw norms are not enough. You know, you can't just count on, oh, the person that, you know, gets this highest office would never would never break the criminal law. Well, Actually, mm. yeah, you know, just to kind of also reframe the, you know, the consequence of the ruling, um, can you maybe help help me explain, like, if a president were to, I don't know, like call in a drone strike on Capitol Hill or shoot protesters in Lafayette Square? Uh, um, Hypothetically. What, Hypothetically, you know, like, like what would the consequences have been prior to the ruling and 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 then after the ruling? Danielle, you all you. About all me. <laughs> well, so so here under the new standard it's going to depend whether it was in the president's official act. Right. So in that hypo, we'd have to determine was was the president, you know, Blowing out people on the steps be as a like in his his or her official duty, you know what I mean? Um, it's a it's gonna it's gonna be a line between unofficial and official, and that's the contentious line that that's exactly where we are, and that's the danger of it. I think Sotomayor mentioned um, that there's this potential for abuse now when the president is not going to be held accountable for questionable conduct because it's going to be considered within um, their official acts. And so what I think might happen uh, moving forward or what could potentially happen uh, are future, to, to Karina's point, future presidents could push the boundaries, just as you're in your hypo, of their official duties. They can they can make Things within, you know, these uh, questionable acts within their official duties, knowing that they would likely be shielded from criminal prosecution for this broad range of actions. Right. So it could the, this ruling could encourage presidents to take controversial, risky, you know, uh, actions because they'll have less fear of legal consequences. And that's the danger of it. Is there, um, is there a I'm sorry to cut you off, but is yeah. there a is there a definition for official acts, or is it just very broad, ambiguous? Man. It's broad. It's going back to the lower court, and the lower court's going to have to determine what these official acts might look like. So, 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 like, just just to put that like in perspective, like, would would official acts be akin to like a job description? You apply for a job. Here are the things that I'm I'm saying that I can do and I'm allowed to do. Is that is that similar? Because it seems like if if it is, like, wouldn't official acts be somewhat defined in the constitution? 
Yeah, I think we have certainly have a starting point, right? The things that we would naturally think, you know, is, and, and certainly what's defined in the Constitution, that's part of the executive, you know, the executive's powers. We have those, uh, you know, explicated pretty clear. But then you have this outer limit that kind of broadens that, this outer limit that the court is saying. Um, uh, so we have a basis, but the lower courts can can work within that and beyond it, it seems. I don't know, Karina, what are you thinking? Yeah, I was just thinking um, I could give you a real life hypo, actually, um, that is a part of this case is that as a direct result of this case, um, the DOJ has now issued a new indictment, a superseding indictment. It's gone through a new grand jury. So, by the way, ordinary citizens, again, you know, as even as the former president um, as, uh, you know, saying this is sham. This is, again, a whole grand jury has said, no, these are indictments. But the uh, DOJ deleted because it said, yeah, I think this is under the Supreme Court's ruling, deleted one of the factual allegations, which was Trump actually turned to uh, his DOJ and said, I want you to um, issue a statement saying we found fraud. It wasn't true. I want you to write letters to the states saying we found fraud. It wasn't true. And like that was part of that is one allegation in the uh, election interference case. Now, listen, the charges stayed the same, but that was one piece of evidence and they deleted it. Why? Because um, he has, he was acting in control of his, you know, AG and DOJ, and that's in a in his official capacity. So, like that, just gives you just a little hint of what he could do. Because the president is the chief executive officer. So, yeah, you can make an order to your, you know, in that very case, right? You're enlisting the DOJ to. You know, even as you complain about a stolen election to steal an election, to engage in in illegal uh, election interference, that would be absolutely immune. In fact, by deleting that, I I mean, the DOJ clearly thinks, oh, this falls within a president's power. Wow. 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 And and that's and and that's a DOJ under a uh, opposing party for the one. Right. So, I mean, that no, this makes... was Trump's DOJ. This was. But I mean, the oh. one they deleted it. Right. The 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 DOJ that deleted it is oh, Biden's right. DOJ. Right. That's right. Good point. So they were even interpreting it um, like even more like they you would think that they would be even more critical or trying to find mm. something just because of, you know, mm-hmm. the way that human nature is. And they're like, well, I guess we got to delete this because now it falls under that and we're not going to be able to use it. It'll be thrown out. I'm assuming that would be their kind of I mean, reasoning. No, they, I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah. I mean, and they, they've they done some other things that we could talk about, you know, as far as the ramifications of this. But just to, you know, I mean, it, it is chilling. It is chilling to me. Um, and there were uh, other allegations in the indictment um, about what he was, uh, 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 that they deleted. And it was um, his senior advisors, um, his lawyers told him look, the election was not stolen. That went into his knowledge and they deleted that and said, actually, you know, conversations, uh, that's part of his, you know, uh, of his official duties is to have conversations. So all of those conversations, we're going to go ahead and take those out. But I mean, it is, you know, it is, it is chilling. You know, what can you do as chief executive officer? You could Going back to your hypo, Will, you could order uh, uh, people being shot. You could say, well, you know, this was um, part of uh, security mob control. Sorry, we had to do it. But yeah, lives were lost. But I declared a national emergency. Frankly, you could declare a national emergency. That's within, I mean, Danielle can speak on this more than I can. But, you know, that's within the presidential's powers. And then you could suspend an election. 
And you know what, Karina, that's such Thanks. a good point, because what it seems like is happening is that the the congressional oversight and the judiciary's ability to check the president's actions are now so much more weakened. So you have impeachment. OK, that's that's a constitutional check on a presidential powers. I mean, maybe. Right. We saw that. Our twice <laughs> impeached, you know, former right, president. Right. Like, that did nothing. No, that does nothing. And so Congress's investigative authority and yeah. judicial review, now they're constrained by this um, presidential immunity ruling. And, so, and to, 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 to piggyback on your point, Danielle, during the Im- impeachment proceedings, you may recall that certain members of the president's party said, you know, we're not going to vote for impeachment. Let the criminal process uh-huh, handle that. Uh-huh. Let the legal process handle that. There is no legal process. Yeah. You know, and those impeachments Man. both went through, not with their votes, but I mean, they went through anyway. What ha- yeah. what what did change? I mean, this is will now be a president with no guardrails. It makes it even more important that we, you know, that you know, people who say, well, you know, I'm voting for policies, character doesn't matter, actually. It upends the whole thing where it's like, do you just vote for character and policies don't matter? I actually, that makes me sad too. Yeah. What absolutely. makes me sad is the law is being suspended. Um, and so we're forced as voters. It's like, wait a minute, what is our power? What is our responsibility? I mean, as Danielle said, so to make uh, the- the institutions we think of, and you think about like this court is the, oh, originalists, let's go back to the founding fathers. The founding fathers, you know, they were distrustful. They were distrustful of the very situation that we've had. They were distrustful of power in any one branch. And that's why they made the whole, you know, separation of powers and everybody's checking everybody else because they didn't trust, right? Absolute power is power that is corrupted. Here we are, despite yeah. our founding fathers, despite this court saying, oh, yeah, we, we are originalists. Like, wow. It, so so to even make this more real to our listeners. And scary. Right, um, and, and, and maybe scary. So I'll throw another hypo. What if uh, President Trump or, you know, or the next president, whoever it is, they get – oh, just for a hypothetical, President Trump, they – they find out, you know, faithful politics gets on their radar and they're like, I don't know about that Will and Josh character. Josh, Josh did like me. Then he didn't. Um, and then I get an FBI raid on my house. Um, is that like, is that possible under this, uh, under this uh, presidential like immunities thing? Go for it, Karina. I'm like, well, it depends on whether— I mean, whether I just you, wonder, yeah. It depends on whether you say it's an official act. I think if you put a tag on there and say— And and by the way, isn't this, like, happening in Florida? Isn't this, like, DeSantis sent in people who were signing <laughs> yeah. a petition and said, well, we're, we're investigating election fraud, but the only people that they're looking at are people that signed the— the petition for the abortion rights. So I, yeah. I'm not really following that, but I'm like, actually, you know, like what is happening here? Um, yeah. But I think if you put an official tag on it, which yep. from now on they will, yes, then they I'm will. like, yeah, I think they could. What do you think, Danielle? No, I think that's exactly right. I think it points to this. I don't know. One of the issues that is coming from this is that, this decision, and along with some others that have come out recently, uh, we're limiting congressional oversight. We're trending toward this super strong executive, this emboldening, powerful, super executive, I'll call it. Um, and it's, tra- I don't know, the trajectory is scary, right? A court that's more willing to protect the executive authority, uh, mm-hmm. exercising within their official powers, and we can call anything within their official powers, I don't know. It's um, it's signaling things ahead. Uh, I think we should be concerned. Man, that is uh, that's really sobering, and that's that's wild. Um, you know, I want to kind of get into the weeds a little bit. I know we have been going with hypotheticals and stuff like that, but 
if we think about like the SCOTUS ruling, thinking about a broad versus a narrow interpretation of presidential immunity, what does that mean? Like broad versus narrow? Kind of, I know we've been kind of talking about it, talking about powers, talking about official acts and things like that. What would a broad interpretation be? What would a narrow interpretation be? And what were kind of the arguments that, like, what were the arguments that prevailed in this? Why, why, why did the Supreme Court say in its official ruling that, you know, these are the reasons why we think this presidential immunity is, uh, should be treated the way that, that, it, that it now is? Yeah. Uh, this can really- I, uh, re- real fast, can I just tack on one more question to that? Because I think it's it's in the same vein. Is like what what was the the count five four? You know, whatever the case six three, and and were and was it from all the same people that we would expect to vote in favor of it? Mm-hmm. Um. So let let's do the broader narrow. It's certainly a broader interpretation of presidential immunity. Um, because now we're shielding actions that we could define however you want to under official duties. So the majority is arguing that what we've already kind of gone over, right? The president needs this insulation um, in order to fulfill their constitutional role effectively. And then you have the dissent that's warning that this is going to be too much, which we just kind of went down that rabbit hole with hypos of what it could look like when the president is above the law and not held accountable for a questionable conduct. So um, the majority is attempting to alleviate the concerns by emphasizing that, well, it only applies to official acts, um, but that's the issue that what's official and unofficial still remains contentious. Um, I have to will Look at how it broke down. It was certainly a 6-3 ruling. Um, and um, But I have to look at who who did what there. It's escaping me at the moment. It, it, it's, it's okay if you don't if you don't have it uh, readily available. Uh, I mean, if if you tell me it's 6-3, you know, my my you can probably uh, get <laughs> I, I think can it, probably it get broke it. down how we thought it would for sure. The, the, yeah. there were powers no. of inference will are great. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna my. say if somebody asked me like who were the vote like I I would I I wouldn't you know that's not something I would track but like the six three I'm like well we do have the six conservatives and I cannot yeah. imagine that one of um the more uh, progressive members of the court would have yeah. said that this was okay. Yeah. In what world? Yeah. It, it, it's almost like I can say with some level of confidence that there was no male dissent. Um, um, much as the same way I can say that regardless of who wins the election in 2024, Trump will say that he won. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but I, I, I want to kind of shift shift gears here a little bit and just talk about like the balance of power, right? Because we have, you know, executive, legislative, judicial, you know, all of these branches are supposed to kind of balance each other out. I think, you know, you can have a good debate on who has more power, Congress or the president, but, but with the immunity ruling, you know, on the surface, it seems like the balance um, has shifted a little bit. Um, So I'd love for you just to kind of talk about like, like, did it shift or is it just a perception thing? And and then maybe we can tack on, you know, like how how do we hold presidents accountable now or, or do we? Yeah, I mean, it appears to shift. Will, I think you're right. I think we're shifting. We're leaning toward the exec- favoring the executive branch now in a way that Karina just mentioned. The founding folks were <laughs> trying to warn against, you know. Um, so now we're, ex- especially since we're expanding the scope of action, protected under this umbrella of official duties. So this is going to strengthen, you know, the presidency at the expense of other branches like Congress and the judicial checks that we have in place. Um, so I think there are long term consequences for the separation of powers. Uh, and how do we check? I mean, impeachment. <laughs> That's a, that's what we have in the Constitution right now. I don't know. Criminally, what do we have, Karina? Con- on the constitutional side, we have impeachment. That is so unsatisfying. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, 
So I can tell you what uh, DOJ, what Jack Smith's office has done, which is um, because these, you know, the conduct is so outrageous and such a deep cut to democracy itself um, that, you know, what that means, um, you know, as Danielle said, you know, there's the official acts, absolute immunity. There's this, what did you call it, Danielle, the outer umbrella the or outer something? perimeter. Yeah, outer the perimeter outer. where it's like. There's presumption you're going to go back. And then there's private acts which don't enjoy immunity. Am I right on that? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Uh So, you know, in the wake of that, I thought it was it was sort of interesting because um, Jack Smith filed a superseding indictment, as I mentioned. And what's interesting about it is all four charges remain. Okay, so like the charges themselves, they are he. Jack Smith's office, the DOJ, is at least saying, no, they stick. They're so bad that, you know, they're they're criminal and they're outside official scope. So here's what they did, though, which I think is just very interesting. Um, They tweaked the indictment. So now it says it makes an allegation. It says that Trump had no official responsibilities for Congress's certification of the 2020 election. Right. So now it's like, well, OK, everything in his official responsibilities, he had none when it comes to this thing of certifying. So, you know, it's like we're not we're going to do all that we can. Uh, and and I mean, I, I think it, I think it's right. It's like, yeah, that's right. Um, but to put it out, you know, not in that umbrella, not, not in that perimeter where people are going to argue it, but, you know, in the side of. There is no re- official responsibility here. Um, also, the um, speech he made at the Capitol, you know, we have to fight. I'll be there with you, which, of course, he wasn't. But um, his speech uh, there, they uh, added language that said this was a campaign speech at a privately funded, privately organized political rally. True. 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 The opening lines of the indictment, which had said uh, Trump was the 45th uh, uh, president, now says uh, Trump was a candidate in the 2020 election. Hmm. Right. Because the things that he was doing, at least, you know, his Trump, his rally that, you know, became an insurrection. uh, That was actually as a candidate. And it was privately funded. But that's the sort of thing, I think, that we can expect to see. Um, You know, as for myself, um, I think, okay, A, smart. B, I believe DOJ when DOJ says, listen, um, a lot, you know, what we have, the core of the indictment, uh, these charges is outside. Um, Now we you've made us prove it. Now you've made us allege it. We're happy to comply. We will now be more clear. And actually, they also filed uh, requesting permission to add now a new brief that they have said we're going to add. We will now be adding uh, new factual allegations that we were actually holding. We don't know what those are yet. But I'm sitting there, when I read about that, I thought, oh, be careful what you ask for, because they had things that are clearly within your private, or at least they're going to allege, are out clearly outside as a private uh, candidate, right? The RNC, right, the, the, or the, you know, the National Republican Committee, uh, NRC, sorry, you know, that, that's, that's not government, that's private. Uh, And so the things that were happening through that um, and, uh, you know, his phone call um, with, you know, the Georgia officials, I just need 11,000 so many votes. uh, That's actually not within his official capacity. That's not what a president does. Um, And so, you know, in this case, it's so beyond the pale that I think there will be things that remain um, but, you know, it, 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 for me, at least, that's um, that's just a reflection of how egregious the behavior is. It does not give me solace 
that, oh, well, you know, there's some guardrails for all the reasons we've talked about. There are not, you know, a sitting president can do so, so much within their official capacity. It's just that the DOJ charges are about, you know, the election interference um, and what happened after the election. Couldn't, couldn't like a, a real, you know, bright, um, creative lawyer, like, which, which I think Todd Blanche was one of his main lawyers that he paid like $3 million, um, um, to, to, to defend him. But couldn't like a lawyer just say, yeah, if it deals with the elections, counting the elections, you know, securing the elections, that that's a duty that falls under the exec, under the executive. Um, cause even though, you know, the, the counting of election of the electoral votes in Congress, it's like one could extrapolate, you know, it's a it's a process in the election um, sort of system um, to pick a president. So anything that I do, you know, to further that particular process is within my official duties. It, like, would that be a good argument or would that just be shot down like like nothing? What do you think, Danielle? I mean, I'm I'm curious as to your opinion as to whether you think, think that would fly. I think that'd be a stretch. I think executive power is actually a bit more narrow in the Constitution than, you know, I think that would be slightly outside of just the um, the scope of president of, of the executive power. Though I think to Karita's point, creative lawyering is going to cut both ways on this moving forward. I mean, it's going to take smart, bright lawyers to argue both sides and see what's, what, what can stick, I think. I don't know. What do you think, Karina? Yeah. I mean, I, I look at that and say he's the chief executive officer. That's what the president is, That's, mm-hmm. is the executive officer. But does the elect, does an election fall within executive? You know, the executive branch is to execute the laws. I, yeah. So I'm like, could you put it? Well, I'm, a, you know, I'm working on executive you know, executing this law, this election law, you know, like maybe, but at that point he had already lost the election. And I think again, so maybe I'm just biased, but I'm like, yeah, if it was privately funded and privately organized and by private, I assume they're talking about the Republican party. I assume they're talking about these political action committees um, that were, I can't remember what it is, Turning Point USA or whatever their the thing is. But, um, you know, I think the stronger argument is, no, this was outside. But, you know, now we could turn and think about how important it is um, of the judge who's actually hearing this. You know, yeah. and we're very, very fortunate, I think. And I say this not as a partisan. But I followed uh, Judge, is it Chukans? Um, uh, Rulings on some other issues. That's a good judge. That is a good, I mean, my sense is this judge has made some rulings that perhaps she has not personally liked to make, but she's going to follow the law. But one could think about, you know, other judges and the fact of just like how damaging that first um, term was because there were judges appointed for lifetime appointments that the ABA said were not qualified, didn't matter. You know, it was all, and Trump said, I have a list. It was given to me by the Federalist Society. It was given to me by the Heritage Foundation, you know, and so it's just like we lost, you know, and those are there for us, you know, that's the gift that keeps giving. Um, I think Judge Cannon is a part of that personally, but, um, you know, I just, uh, it, now it's like really going to matter just as Danielle says, well, you're going to see creative lawyering on both sides. Sure. You sure are. Um, but it also puts pressure on the judges that are hearing this and there were an unprecedented number of appointments. Yeah, that's so true, Karina. I mean, I think, well, to you and Karina's point, Article 2 of the Constitution gives the president the responsibility to execute and enforce the laws created by Congress. That's some broad, that's broad language. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, um, so, I mean, 
I guess we'll see, Will. I kind of no. wish you hadn't asked that question. <laughs> oh, I mean, so I'm it out there. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, yeah. Okay, so we have official v unofficial um, mm-hmm. duties, right? So we've kind of talked about how that has to be interpreted. That's that's why that can be broadly interpreted or narrowly interpreted. But what might be a distinction? Like you had mentioned. You had mentioned it's privately funded. So so what would be the distinction, some general rules between official and unofficial duties? And is this something like, is Congress going to have to come up with like, or maybe like th- there'll be a move to try to come up with a list of real official, like very specific official versus unofficial duties in order to put a check on presidential power? Yeah, I think that's a good question, Josh. And I think it really builds what, on what we were just talking about. So so Article 2 of the Constitution is what's outlining the powers of the president or the executive. And that's the language I just gave us, which is very broad. You have to, you're responsible for executing, you know, the laws of Congress. And that's broad. Um, and that's v- unlike... Um, powers that are like expressly listed under Article One of the Constitution, where we have a list of uh, Congresses and like things. So the executive and under Article Two isn't listed in that way. And so that's why we're getting this broad interpretation thing happening because we don't have explicit lists of things that are falling under um, the powers of the presidents. We're just getting that he has to be able to do, he or she or they have to be able to do what's necessary to um, ensure the day-to-day affairs. Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point, will there be legislation or something like that? I don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Danielle, but I I don't think that Congress, because that would be like Congress saying this is what falls under Article 2. That's a a matter of constitutional interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, Congress might have something to say about it. They, this is what we think, which would be, you know, part of what gets considered. But, you know, it's the courts, we know, you know, it's the duty of the court to say what the law is, to say what the Constitution means. And so, you know, this would be something I assume that would be, you know, this is the sort of thing where you get case law, right? You, you, this stuff gets fleshed out by litigation. And at some point, you know, some later case, I hope we never see another case like this. I hope we never have another executive that bring, you know, that brings us to a place where we're here. Part of the reason we're here is because it's such a blank slate. We've never had, you know, in the entire history of the Republic, we've never had anything like this. But what? I think future cases and like, so how does that make you feel, Josh, that this would like possibly yeah. go back up to the Supreme Court to s- sort this out? I don't, I, I doesn't <laughs> make me feel great. And I guess my question that comes is why, why has this been the case that it's such a blank slate? Is it because like you guys had said earlier, I mean, it, it's just like there are norms that people just a- assumed that people would follow just proceed norms of procedure, but nothing official. Why, why is this? Why are we in this situation? I guess. Do you want to take it? Go ahead, Karina, take it. Oh, I'm just like, cause we've never had a criminal former president, you know, like literally, <laughs> if you think about this, even Nixon, he resigned. Yep. You know, like we've never and never like never, ever Taylor Swift ever. Right. Never have we had a president, have we had a president not uh, participate in the peaceful transition of power? Like not ever. And that's what that case is about, is resisting the peaceful transition of power. And so it's just like, you know, it, to the extent we've had um malfeasance in the office it's been as danielle said about civil liability yeah so we have an election coming up no you don't Um, say (laughs) not sure if you're aware um 
what what do you think this type of ruling will have um you know kind of two things both in the public trust of like our judicial system um and and then more broadly on the political system um i mean and p- part of my fear isn't so much trump you know getting elected back into office you know, running amok of the government, of our democracy. It's the person that comes after Trump um, that will see what, you know, Trump did and be like, oh, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't dare to dream big enough. Um, you know, and, and that's the person I'm probably more afraid of. So, so I'd, I'd love to just get, get both of your thoughts kind of on the, you know, public trust on the judicial system and then, implications of this ruling kind of on our broader political system. Um, you, you, you can go, Daniel. Yeah. Um, I mean, just listening to all four of us on this uh, podcast, there's a lot of skepticism and un, uh, online and uh, uncertainty, which is at all levels right now. Um, and so I certainly think as far as public trust is concerned, especially given the timing of a very polarized political climate, um, public trust goes down, right? I mean, it's, if it's not already tanked, uh, I don't know if it can go lower. If there's any lower it can go, I think that's the way it goes. Um, I think you're, we're, everything's getting more deeply divided after this. You know what I mean? Like, so my, no matter how you're viewing this, through whatever partisan lens, um, I think the trust uh, of things goes away. As far as influence on elections, I certainly think it's uh, the ruling is going to play a part in the framing, right? So the framing of political power uh, is going to come up a lot until we get through November. Um, candidates are going to be very vocal about their position on executive accountability, um, we're going to see one party advocating for a stronger check on the president. The other is going to be in defense. I mean, you know, I just, just what, just what you think is going to happen. I think it's going to happen. I think it will happen. Uh, and I think this will have an impact on how voters are going to perceive accountability, balance of power. And I think that will have a big impact on what happens in November, you know, depending on whether we want to see a bigger check or a lesser check on that power. Yeah. Um, so one question I've had, and, and, you know, I'd love all three of your you know perspectives on this is how much are people paying attention? Because, you know, people like Danielle, uh, and me to a lesser extent, you know, I've been I've been with the death penalty for a while and, and thinking about that. But, you know, people who are thinking constitutional law professors uh, are very, you know, like they're paying attention and they see the danger. Um, the very fact that you had this podcast says, OK, I, I'm paying attention to this. But note how you opened it. An issue that hasn't gotten a whole lot, you know, like. Are people, do you think people are paying attention? So that's a question I I would love to have, you know, I'd love to hear y'all's perspective. Now, that having been said, um, I think Kamala Harris has done, you know, has um, contributed to people paying attention. You know, I think part of her talking points are, you need to understand what a second term would look like. And we've got this immunity. You think he was unhinged before. He's got no guardrails. I mean, she's literally said he has no, he would have no guardrails. That guy, by the way, the guy that told you to inject bleach, you know, like that guy would have no guardrails. So I I feel like she's making it more prominent, but, you know, it's always a thing, really, when the Supreme Court issues these huge decisions, and they're mainly legalistic. Like, you overturn Roe versus Wade, and the country's, like, awake. Um, but other decisions that are absolutely as impactful, um, you know, are are kind of belong to the lawyers um, uh, until they don't, until those, you know, someone gets in without guardrails, and it's like, wait a minute, they can do that? And then it's too late. So, I, you know, I, I, I think you're right. I think, um, 
Danielle, I think one party is like really scared and trying to make it more prominent. I think there's another party that's trying to make it less prominent. Oh, don't you worry yeah. about that. Um, so, yeah. but I, I don't know how much it's out there. I know um, Kamala Harris is trying to put it out there, but I, I don't have a sense of that because I do feel like I'm invested in paying attention. What do you think, Danielle? Do you think it's out there? And then I really do want to hear from like Josh and Will too. I'm not sure. Maybe Josh and Will can speak. I'm, I'm, maybe we're out of touch with just the greater public. I don't know. Maybe Josh and Will are the people aware of what's happening. I mean, I probably would be a little bit more representative than Will because he pays attention so deeply to this stuff. And I don't mean that in any negative way. It's awesome. But he's like, he's tuned in to all of this. And I kind of sometimes intentionally don't tune in to some of this stuff because of, you know, how stressful it can be. But I think that's part of the double-edged sword of all this is that, you know, you're like, ah, I don't know. Well, does the president, because I've always kind of grown up thinking, ah, who cares who's president? Mm -hmm. I mean, it felt like it doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah, this person, they're going to argue and, and this person likes abortion more and this person, you know, is for same sex marriage and then all that. But I, I don't know. It doesn't really affect me. And, and, and in many ways it hasn't. And yet that doesn't have to remain the same. And maybe I just don't even know the ways that it has because it's imperceptible at first. And like you said, then it, we don't know until we have to face some issue that we didn't think we'd have to face. And I think in the last, the last few presidents, the most, and I've gotten, uh, you know, I've really come into my adult, you know, life, you know, I graduated 2004 from high school. So I really came into my adult life when Obama was being elected in 2008 and then kind of saw you know, felt the effect more of the presidency. So I don't know if that's me getting older or if there's really more of an effect. I think it's a little bit of both at this point. But I mean, I was aware of the immunity uh, ruling, but I wasn't aware necessarily of the implications of it, that this conversation has kind of, you know, brought it back to my attention. I'm like, man, that's uh, not good. It's not good. I don't know. What do you think, Will? Yeah, so I would agree. I don't think you all are disconnected. I think that folks are f following the immunity thing um, kind of in the same vein that they may be following, you know, dog eating kind of thing. It's like they they know it's out there. They don't necessarily know the true implications. They assume that there are certain guardrails still in place um, that Trump would not, you know, actually shoot people in Lafayette Square, you know, he wouldn't actually try to put a moat around the United States and fill it with alligators, um, like all things he's actually considered, <laughs> you know, and and um, people are just I don't know, they, they're they're comfortable not knowing kind of like what 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 Josh just said. Um, but my 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 biggest concern would be the the first time. Democrats utilize the immunity ruling to protect, you know, their president. So, for instance, you know, if the if the special weaponization of government like <laughs> like committee goes after Biden for something, you know, that he did as president and they try to subpoena him and they go through this whole thing. And then, you know, the the um, the person that the 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 person that represents the United States in Supreme Court cases what's that person called again forgot the solicitor uh, general thank you solicitor yeah, yeah. General. <laughs> so like somehow like, i had that in my mind oh, somehow I like and you did not that sorry no, i was like just I, being the like you were much better to take that cuz it was like <laughs> solicit <laughs> yeah yes. so so like if the solicitor general ends up using you know the the immunity argument then like there goes any hope whatsoever of us trying to change it because it's almost like now the Democrats have found some use for it. And now our entire democracy is just, you know, that there are no guardrails. So, you know, it, yeah, it, is, you, it, is, it is sort of depressing, sad. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to record this episode is just to hopefully shed some light on the on the subject to the um, hundred or so people that are going to listen to this. <laughs> and um 
you know, just try to bring awareness like, hey, like you can you can think all the things you want about Trump <clears throat> or Biden um, and about the implications, but try to think bigger. Think about think about the person that's going to be worse than yeah, the person or, we don't know about yet. Yeah, the person that we don't know anything about, you know, like like what if what if Michael Avenatti decided to run for president, you know? Um, <laughs> that'd be a nightmare and he's a Democrat, you know? <laughs> so, um, I, I think just people need, just need to kind of think past, past the, the goal line, um, about the dangers that we're, we're not, we're not expecting or, or seeing. So, um, well, that well, makes me, I, I, you know, I'm just so thankful that you had an episode and that we were able to have this conversation. You know, that makes yeah. this work that you all do with faithful politics all the more important because, you know, Absolutely. you are, you know, a way you're that that funnel that can help get, you know, the word out to ordinary people who then might just be outraged enough to post on Facebook or talk to their neighbor about it or say like, would you believe this? Um, and, you know, so you just don't know the effect that it had, but I, I know that um, I'm happy. I, for one, you know, was really happy to, to be here and um, thank, you. thank you both. Yeah. yeah th thank you. And, and so I, um, be before we close, I, I do need to ask you, Karina, just a little bit about this book. So oh. t t tell me about this book that you've been working for <laughs> and over for so long seems a like a labor of love a call of faith um you know you i don't get to the to the faith part frankly until the acknowledgments so you know it's not i'm not you know it's not a, a book where i talk about faith but it was certainly a, a call to write it came from that but um it's called secrets of the killing state and the untold story of lethal injection and um i wrote it for a smart, uh, intellectually curious um, general public. So, uh, you know, I'm not just talking to other law professors um, or, you know, academics or researchers. I'm trying to talk to everyone. And interestingly enough, um, my editor, since we're on Faithful Politics, my editor at NYU Press chose uh, Easter 2025 as the release date. So it's coming out Easter 2025. She said, it's a good time to think about state killing and redemption. <laughs> and I was yes, like, all right. right, yes, it is. Okay, let's go. Well, anyway, I have since found out, I just found out last week. Um, so Easter 2025, again, the release date that was set, you know, nearly a year ago, 18 months in advance, um, Easter 2025 is will be the um, jubilee uh, in the Catholic Church, which I'm not Catholic, so this is news to me. But apparently the Pope declares once every 25 years-ish uh, that that Easter will be the jubilee. And uh, thousands upon thousands of pilgrims come to Rome, to the Vatican, to celebrate this once-a-generation Easter. And um, I only know really about this because a friend of mine forwarded me. Uh, the Pope has declared the theme for the Jubilee is hope. And his Exhibit A that he wants to talk about, like, I don't know if it's the only thing or if it's the main thing, but um, is ending the death penalty. What? So wow. I was, yeah, right. I was like, wait a minute. The day our book comes out, the day my book, but I say our because NYU Press is amazing, but um, they've been a great partner. But the day that book comes out, the world's Catholics will be listening to the Pope talk about ending the death penalty. So I'm like, well, you know, faithful politics. Faithful that politics. is uh, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Now, yeah. now, now I, I, I do have to ask. So as a professor that that writes a book. Um, can you make that required reading of your students just to kind of help with the sales? Like, can you just go ahead and ask the school <laughs> no, to buy? Of course you can. She has professor copies. immunity. Professor oh, immunity. there we go. Back to immunity. We can talk more about the book another time. Um, I hope we'll, you know, have other conversations. It's going to be a great book. I'm excited about that book. I have kind of seen her in the process oh. and oh. it's going to be fantastic. So I'm excited about it. I need to too. I need to give a plug. I mean, which, you know, I ordinarily would not do, but it's faithful politics. Um, Danielle Wingfield has been my prayer warrior sister. She has walked the walk. She has walked this walk. And actually, she is in my acknowledgments because in my lowest moment, 
it was her prayer that sustained me. Um, so so cool. anyway, awesome. there was a very low Faithful moment politics. and it was all her, but she's been there, you know, she's been walking with me this entire time. So very great that, for that. That is super, I love super it. awesome. Well, thanks yeah. again, you two, for yeah. stopping by, hanging out with us for a little bit, answering our questions. Um, and as, as more unfolds on this topic, I'm, I would love to have, um, you back. So, thanks, uh, thanks again. And, uh, and thanks to our audience. Um, and remember, keep your conversations not right or left, but up. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Hey there, Josh Bertram here, faithful host of the Faithful Politics Podcast. I want to let you know about a compelling new spinoff, the Faith Roundtable, where I'll be interviewing top faith leaders, theologians, and scholars to unpack the pressing issues that are shaping the church in America today. We'll dive into topics like faith and public life, social justice, and how we can engage our communities more effectively. Make sure you don't miss any of our enlightening conversations by subscribing to it on our YouTube channel. Join me at the Faith Roundtable, where deep discussion meets thoughtful insight.